Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for the video cast of Lesson 3.2. And this is part of a series of lessons on imperial patterns. And today what we're looking at is Greece. How is it that Greece ended up becoming an empire? Let's step back though a little bit, back to the ancient period, and remind ourselves that the Greeks are descendants of the Indo-Europeans, the third wave of migra migrants who ended up uh, moving into uh, what is now Greece. They are also heavily influenced by the Semitic migrations, particularly the Phoenicians. And you might remember the Phoenicians uh, invented the alphabet and then set up trade colonies throughout the Mediterranean. And that contact, as we'll see, has a big influence on later Greek culture. So starting with the pre-classical era of Greece, first of all, let's start with the Bronze Age. Um, this is the time of two early civilizations, uh, the first of which is, is uh, the Minoan civilization, which is on the bottom of this map, and the Mycenaeans to the north. The Minoan civilization, we call that because of King Minos. And you might remember the story of the Minotaur, this half bull, half man creature that lives in this labyrinth underneath a palace. We have found a palace that had a labyrinth under it, and we call the people that lived there the Minoans. We don't know what they called them themselves. They had a writing system, though, that we cannot decipher. It's called Linear A, and there's a couple of symbols I want you to notice. Um, that we There's very few uh, extent uh, pieces of text, and so it's really hard for us to decipher that. But you'll notice that a couple of those symbols look surprisingly like later Greek symbols and also like the uh, writing system for the Mycenaeans. Now, Mycenaeans are the people of this kingdom and you might recall if you learned if you still learn in your freshman year in English about the story of the Trojan War. King Agamemnon allegedly brought all the Greeks together and sailed to fight against Troy. This is a mask that is called the mask of Ab uh, Agamemnon. It's a funeral mask. It's like a thin piece of gold that was laid over the face of a king. We don't really know if that was Agamemnon himself, but it, clearly he was a pretty important person. The Mycenaeans, though, also had their own writing system, and there's a couple of symbols you might notice that look very, very so similar to the writing system of the Minoans. This is known as Linear B. Now, we can decipher this. There's still not a whole lot of, of material to work with, but this one is definitely a Greek language, and so we call these the ancestors of the Greeks. Now, after this, we get to a dark age. It's called that because these invaders that the Greeks had no idea where they came from had iron weapons. They're fighting against people with bronze weapons, and they're just slaughtering people all over the Mediterranean, not just the Greeks. It leads to a great deal of chaos, both politically and culturally, because whatever writing system they had before is now completely lost. They're, all these people are conquered and sort of left to fend for themselves after the arrival of the invaders. Then we get to the Archaic Age. Now, in the Archaic Age, a new writing system is born. And it's, it's based on the Phoenician alphabet that the, the Semitic peoples in the Mediterranean brought with them. But you will also see there are some unusual things, like the, the letter Psi, for example, seems to have been an earlier symbol. But the idea is that the writing system was brought to write down the stories of Homer, that is to say, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, that's the traditional legendary story from the Greeks. We don't know if that's actually true or not, uh, but it's an interesting uh, aside. The other thing about this, though, is that at this point, kings are above the law. This is a kind of system known as autocracy, and it's going to come up again uh, in the next couple of lessons. Autocracy, rule of self, like the king has no constraints upon his power whatsoever. 
That was the situation in the Archaic Age. But that takes us then into the classical period of ancient Greece. The system that was used was called the polis system. Polis is a word that means city-state. Now, here's what I need you to understand. The Greeks did not call themselves Greeks. They called themselves Hellenes. They all thought they were descendants from this guy named Hellene, who was the leftover from a flood. So they recognized they didn't uh, have the same uh, government. They were city-states, but they did speak the same language and they worshipped the same gods. Those people that worshipped the same gods as the Greek gods spoke the Greek language were called Hellenes. But if I lived in a city-state and you lived in a city-state, we both were Hellenes, we were considered foreigners. That is the polis system. In other words, they're a bunch of city-states. Now, each of these city-states was free to set up their own system. And this is an important distinction because they came up with a whole lot of different systems. But one of the things that they all had in common was that they set up a system of laws that made autocracy very, very difficult. In other words, no one should be above the law. This was an idea that was foundational to all of the Greek polis, which is the plural for polis, uh, but they did it in very different ways. For example, in Athens, their system is known as di direct democracy. Citizens voted directly on the issues. They didn't vote for people. They voted yes or no on whether or not they should do particular things. On the other hand, Sparta was a military oligarchy. In that si uh, system, there's a family of military rulers who join together. It's a small group of powerful men who are basically running the government. Yes, they have a king, but the king is from one of only two families, and he's part of this small group of people that are essentially running everything. Nonetheless, they are all constrained to a certain degree by the laws of the particular land. Now, at this point, Persia sort of overextends its empire. And you might remember that Xerxes is the one that, that tries to take over Greek territory. There's a revolt in Greek colonies that are within the Persian Empire in Anatolia, what's now Turkey. And the uh, king of kings, Xerxes, tries to put them down, but then he goes further. And he actually tries to invade mainland Greece. He wants to make Europe part of his giant empire. Now, the uh, um, Spartans put up a good fight. If you've ever seen the movie 300, it's a pretty good movie. It's not entirely accurate, but it's a good movie. They put up a fight uh, in terms of the land force, but it's really the naval force which is headed up by the Athenians that conquers the uh, Persians. When I say conquer, though, they're not just, they're not like taking over Persian territory, they're just expelling the Persians from the Greek mainland. Uh, so the, the point, though, is the Athenians, who were the head of the navy, are now in a really powerful position. They're like the most powerful of the city-states. This then leads to the Athenian Golden Age, the Age of Pericles. Something I want to point out about Pericles, though. It's the Age of Pericles. He's not a king. He was the leader of the military force of the Athenians, and so he's given a whole lot of credit and stature, but he's not a king. In their system of direct democracy, he's more like what we might call a speaker of the house. He's the guy that sets the agenda. He decides what people are, what citizens are going to vote on and what they're not going to vote on. He's a leader, but he's not a king. This is also a period, though, of a great uh, golden age of culture. So the drama that you associate with ancient Greece, this all happened in the century of 
uh, Pericles in the age of Pericles. Uh, Sophocles is one of the uh, dramatists that you'll read about, I think, in your 10th grade English class. This is also the time of the great philosophers. Socrates had a student named Plato who had a student named Aristotle, all of them proclaiming this idea that we'll get into more next week, that reason is the way to truth. Aristotle may be chief among them because, as we'll see later on, he was, in fact, the teacher for the uh, figure that sort of changes uh, Greece into an empire. It's also the time of great math and science. Pythagoras, he had a theorem, and Hippocrates, who the, the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take to this day is named after him. All of this happening in that time when Pericles was the leader of the council. And also architecture, and a guy you've probably never heard of, Phidias, but I guarantee you you've seen his work, He's the guy that designed the Acropolis, including the uh, Parthenon, which of which there is a replica in Nashville right now. Uh, but the whole design was a kind of public work, a, an infrastructure, because it was designed for everybody. Citizens would go there to vote, but even non-citizens could go there to worship and also to watch the drama of the era. On the other hand, though, Sparta, at the same time, is kind of jealous of what's going on in Athens. Like, they're a military society, and they withheld the, the army of Persia uh, very gallantly, but Athens is now sort of the most powerful group, and they're not really happy about that. This leads to what becomes known as the Peloponnesian Wars. You can think of them as a kind of uh, civil wars between Hellenes. And you've got two particular groups. The Delian League, which is Athens and its allies. And if you notice on this map, the Athenian allies are colonies all around the Aegean Sea. On the other hand, you've got Sparta and its allies, known as the Peloponnesian League, because they're all based around primarily the Peloponnese, the, the uh, mountains that are on that peninsula on the south. They fight, and it's a long, brutal, ugly fight. It's just horrible. In the end, Sparta wins, quote-unquote, but the truth is, they're so weakened that just to the north of the main city-states of Greece, there's this Hellene named uh, Philip of Macedon. Macedon, his kingdom, is sort of viewed as this backwater, like it's not really a real place, but he's gathered a large army. And in doing so, when he sees that all the city-states, even though Sparta won, are weakened after their Peloponnesian Wars, he decides he's just going to conquer more territory. And he does so relatively easily. But he is assassinated at one of his daughter's weddings quite unexpectedly, and he has quite a few sons, and so there's this question about who exactly is going to take over. Well, the guy that takes over starts the Hellenistic era. Hellenistic, spreading Greek culture and language. And the figure is uh, Philip's son, Alexander. Alexander the Great is what he'll, he will be known as throughout the rest of history. He continues, after he consolidates his power, uh, Philip's conquest. He conquers all of the Greek states, but he then goes further. He is really, really pissed off at Persia for the fact that they attacked uh, several generations before him. This is a really famous fresco from a Roman villa 
that depicts on the left Alexander and on the right Darius III, who at that time was the king of kings of Persia. But there's a couple things I want you to notice. First of all, look at Alexander. Like, his hair's all messed up. His eyes are wide. He hasn't shaved in days. I guarantee you he is hungover as heck. He's about 20 years old at the time, maybe 19. And he's just riding in a battle, just you know, crushing everybody. Here, on the other hand, is Darius III, the king of kings, the civilized leader. And he's an older man, and he's kind of shocked. Like, what is this dude doing? Who is this guy? Like, this, this kid just rolls in here and starts swamping over people. What the heck is going on? Nonetheless... Alexander crushes the army of Darius the uh, Third. This is down here in uh, the the area that's now Turkey, and Darius flees. But Alexander is going after him. He's not done. In fact, he keeps going and going and going. He will eventually lead to. Uh, freeing Egypt. They consider him a liberator from the Persians. Uh, he gets a uh, prophecy from a priest at Siwa out in the desert that says that his real father was not Ma uh, Philip of Macedon, but actually Zeus himself. He's, in other words, a god, and he believes this, and so do his men, because he then takes them back into the um, Levant and into Mesopotamia, into Persia itself, chasing, chasing, chasing Darius the Third until eventually Darius's own men kill him because they're so concerned. They think if maybe they kill Darius, Alexander will stop chasing us. Nonetheless, Alexander conquers this huge territory, Persia, Mesopotamia, the area of the Levant, Greece itself, this is a giant, giant empire. However, Alexander has no heir and he has no plan. Like, there is no system set up for how to try to administer this giant territory. The diatoki is the name, the Greek word, for the generals after him. The plan is, after Alexander dies, there's nowhere to take over, there's no system, so his entire conquered territory is divided up among his generals, the diatoki. So that's cool, but then they begin fighting each other. They all want more territory, and they start, like, it's a, almost kind of like a civil war. It, the empire is crumbling, but it, there's two particular families that start to prevail. The first of these in the area that is Persia are the Seleucids. General Seleucus, uh, then his descendants in the area that is Persia, and Ptolemaeus, uh, another general, the Ptolemids, in the area that's known as Egypt. Incidentally, um, Cleopatra... Once upon a time, you used to read uh, Julius Caesar in your English class. Uh, she was actually a Ptolemyd. She was not uh, Egyptian, even though she spoke the Egyptian language. She could read hieroglyphs, and she understood their religion quite well. She was actually Greek. So all of those two, all of those generals eventually they're conquered until only to prevail. The Ptolemids and the Seleucids. They are controlling trade throughout the Mediterranean region and also into the Indian Ocean and the Silk Roads. Now, this is something we'll come back to. We're gonna look at the key concepts involving with trade in more detail in a later chapter. But the point is the diatoki like, they start off with a bunch of different territories divided among the generals, but in the end, it's the dynasties of two of those generals that control all of the territory. 
Here's the thing, though. Even though the empire starts to split very quickly after Alexander's death, Greek language and culture spreads dramatically. This is what's known as Hellenization. Greek language and culture spreads throughout Afro-Eurasia, and, and this comes back to the idea of Aristotle's influence. Aristotle was a teacher of Alexander when he was a child, and he taught Alexander that Greek, the Greek way of life was just superior to everybody. It's kind of a, an ideology in that regard, but that if you build Greek cities and fill it with Greek people, everybody will see that the Greek ways are just better. And so while Alexander had no real plan in terms of political administration, he did have a plan in terms of building cities. If you look, all of the cities here in red, all the dots in red, are cities that are built after Alexander. He builds Greek cities. He brings Greek uh, colonists in who migrate into these cities, and that becomes the standard. Greek language becomes the standard uh, throughout the Middle East for political engagements. Greek culture, the idea of reason and laws become the basis for a great deal of what's going on. On the other hand, just to the west of Greece, there's this upstart called Rome. Rome, as we'll see in the next lesson, starts off as a city-state, a relatively small kingdom, but it will have a few turn of events that leads to it, it expanding its territory greatly until eventually it takes over all of Greece and the part of uh, the Hellenistic Empire that had been in Asia. I want to thank you for your attention. I hope that you were able to uh, fill in the blanks and annotate. Again, we're going uh, top down. It's a kind of chronological story for ancient Greece. I look forward to seeing you in class. The next lesson is on Rome, and as you'll see, quite a few similarities, but also differences there. Thanks again, guys.